Welcome to Your Gardening Week. I'm Gardener Scott, and I discuss everything gardening so that you can become a better gardener. Today, for about the next 90 minutes, we'll be discussing a wide array of gardening topics. I'll be answering questions from last week's live stream. I'll be answering questions from this week's live stream. I'll be discussing some of my philosophies about how you can become the best gardener that you can. And I'll even talk a little bit about what I've accomplished this last week and looking ahead to the next week for my own gardening week. I encourage if you're watching this live, let me know where you're from. Let me know your questions. Let me know all about the gardening week that you've had and are beginning. And if you're watching this on replay, same thing. Give me your questions and comments below and I'll do all I can to answer, even if you can't be here live. Let's go ahead and start briefly as people are joining the stream with a series of questions that I got last week, all having to deal with fertilizer. And fertilizer is one of those subjects that is very misunderstood when it comes to gardening. I'm still trying to find out as much as I can about it, and I've been doing this for a number of years. So let's start. Eugene Jagubowski had asked a question. How much fertilizing do you recommend in container gardening? And Liliet Cardoso said, my beets are growing slowly outside in, very, in my raised bed. Are they heavy feeders? Megan Gerwell was concerned with her seedlings, saying the seedlings are pale green now. Are they going to be okay? And Daddy Carl said, my radish seeds sprouted and have leaves. I was wondering if I need to put fertilizer for it to grow. Well, so you can see between beets and radishes and tomatoes and containers, fertilizer is a concern on many gardeners' mind. And so let me give just a brief, broad perspective of what fertilizers are and how they work. So when you buy a fertilizer, you're going to see three numbers on the package. That's the NPK, the nitrogen, the phosphorus, and the potassium. And those are three of the macronutrients that all plants need, which is why they're so common in fertilizers. Nitrogen is responsible for the green growth. So if you want your plant to grow tall and big and green, you'll use nitrogen. Phosphorus tends to be used for flowers and roots. It's, it's the nutrient that the plant uses to grow. And then potassium basically just helps manage the plant. It's it's like the plant manager in the human world where they're overseeing everything, how it works, putting all the pieces together and trying to keep the plant operating at maximum efficiency. So if all three of those nutrients are in place, in adequate amounts, the plant should do well. The problem when it comes to our home gardens is knowing which fertilizer to use, how much to use, and which of the nutrients are most beneficial. A soil test becomes very important here, and you may have heard me say this before. My soil test showed that I was deficient in all three of those macronutrients. So that means I either need to amend my soil to bring those nutrients up to adequate levels, or I need to add fertilizers to give to the plants because my soil doesn't have enough. So right off the top, amend your soil. By putting compost and organic material into the soil, you will be creating those nutrients. <clears throat> As you decide what plants to grow, now you can focus on very specific fertilizers if you know your soil is deficient, like I am. So if you want to grow a big, bushy, green plant, and so think of plants like lettuce and spinach where we're eating green leaves. Well, those plants are going to need nitrogen as their primary nutrient. Root plants like the beets and the radish are probably going, <coughs> excuse me, I have honey in my tea today. 
those root vegetables are going to probably need more of the phosphorus, which is why when you plant bulbs, flower bulbs in the fall, you'll typically add a phosphate fertilizer. And most soils actually have pretty good levels of potassium, and potassium doesn't work its way through the soil as a fertilizer very well. So a balanced fertilizer. <clears throat> a fertilizer that is a 5-5-5 five, 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 or a 10-10-10 is usually adequate to give a broad release of nutrients for the plants. But when it comes to your specific plant and what fertilizer you need, you'll have to think in terms of how good your soil is, what nutrients you're lacking, especially for seedlings. If you're using a potting mix that has fertilizer in it, then you probably don't need to add any fertilizer at all. In fact, adding fertilizer can create some problems. If you're using a seed starter mix with no nutrients at all, and your plants start to turn pale green, you probably need to add fertilizer because there's no nutrition for the plant. In your garden, if your soil is very poor, expect that you're going to have to add nitrogen to almost everything. For the root crops, think in terms of phosphorus. I'll have future videos where I'll talk more about this because you can overdo it. Tomatoes are a prime example. If you add a lot of nitrogen fertilizer to tomatoes, you'll get big, beautiful, bushy, green plants, and you probably won't get very many actual flowers and fruit to develop because the nitrogen is just causing the plant to grow so well. Too much nitrogen, you're not going to get the fruit. So in that case, you need to cut back on the nitrogen. You need to increase the phosphorus. This is why it becomes so misunderstood, because it can be quite complicated. So look for more information in the future. This is one of those topics that I suggest you delve deeper into by watching videos and reading books and doing searches for fertilizing plants. So we're up to over 100 people viewing now. Let's go ahead and see who we've got. Uh, I do want to highlight Traveling Through because Traveling Through was the first one on today, is often the first one to comment on my video. So I appreciate your support. I appreciate your patience because you're obviously waiting as the new videos are coming out. And I want to point out while we get started here, this is a great time of year for me. Things are really starting to happen in the garden. So last night, Sunday, I actually started with a third video for the week. And that's my plan moving forward. I've got videos on Wednesdays and Fridays that you're probably familiar with. Well, if I can keep up my production schedule, I'll be adding Sunday videos as well because there's just so much to talk about. So I hope you look forward to those videos and watch them. So <clears throat> Mama 130 in Kentucky, windy, cool, 40 degrees, and you're a rookie gardener. Well, welcome. It's great that you're here. Deborah's asking what zones you're all from. So yes, please share that. Robin is Michigan 5B. Emily is 5B in Ontario. And I mentioned this in a video. Um, that's interesting because we've got Michigan 5B, Ontario 5B. I'm in Colorado. I'm in 5B. Right now, it's snowing outside at my house and the temperature is below freezing. Last week, the highs were in the 70s. That's about 21 degrees Celsius. Overnight, my temperature dropped down to about 14 degrees. That's minus 11 Celsius. So in just a few days, the plants that are starting to grow in my garden had a temperature difference of almost 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Just because we're all in 5B, our climate is different and our weather is different. And so I'll share often 5B plant information, but do realize that your local environment is different than mine. And even though we're all 5B, it's going to be different. <clears throat> MH is in Virginia with 7A. Garden down south. Good to see you. Alabama in 8B. Uh, 9B from Susan in central Florida. 
James got eight inches of snow. Uh, and it looks like Janan has uh, an expected high of 78 degrees Fahrenheit today in Northern California 9B. So um, thanks for sharing all that information. Susan hit 91 yesterday with a feel like temperature of 99. Uh, in very hot regions in particular, the humidity gets so high that it feels much hotter. Right now, I'm dealing with the opposite. Yesterday, it was extremely windy and temperatures were close to freezing. That wind with the wind chill made the feel like temperature much lower. So I effectively did nothing in my garden yesterday. So Rob, good to see you. I know that you've been wanting to make it to the live stream and I'm glad you made it. So lots to cover. I'll get back to some of the questions from last week, and then we'll get to the questions you have from this week. I will point out, by all means, ask a question as we proceed, but I may miss your question as it scrolls up through the comments. <clears throat> I'll try to get to the questions as much as I can, but as we're showing right now, I'll get to the previous week's questions as much as possible. And if I don't cover your question, either live or from a previous week. <clears throat> it may be because I've got a video coming out that will cover that in much more depth. And in some of those cases, I'll try to point that out. Okay, so I do want to start off with a comment from Sid Boswell. Last night, or last week, I was talking about potatoes and gave a lot of quick answers to growing potatoes. And Sid pointed out saying, I believe that in some areas, planting store-bought potatoes is not legal due to potential diseases. And that is true, and it's not just for potatoes. If you go to order seeds, or specifically um, um, plants, you may see that there's a restriction as to shipping that, those plants. That's often because of an agricultural business within your state, and they don't want anything brought into the state that might cause problems. So Utah and Idaho, for instance. Idaho is known for their potato crops. Well, they don't think it's a great idea <clears throat> if you start growing potatoes that might come from Maine or someplace else. So as you Think in terms of taking store-bought produce and trying to grow it in your garden. Do be aware that there might be some laws in your locale that prohibits that. There's not going to be vegetable police running around into your garden, but do be aware that you could be harming an industry within your state if you're not careful about the source of what you're growing. Okay, uh, Mia Nami said, if San Marzano tomatoes can only get their flavor because they're grown in the valley of Mount Vesuvius because of that rich volcanic soil, how can seeds be grown and sold anywhere else? And I really like this question. And, and I think some of you might have this same issue as well, where San Marzano is an Italian paste tomato. It's delicious. Well, it's famous in Italy for growing near Mount Vesuvius in that volcanic soil. But I've grown San Marzano in my garden. And I know some of you, based on comments from my seed video, are also planning on growing San Marzano tomatoes. So how can they taste good here in the United States when they come from Italy? And now we get into the idea of <coughs> genetics. So a San Marzano tomato tastes good because the genetics of that tomato make it taste good. Now, it might not taste exactly the same in my garden because some of the minerals in my soil are gonna be different than the minerals in the Italian soil. But for the most part, San Marzano tomatoes that are grown in Colorado are gonna taste very much like San Marzano tomatoes that are grown in Italy because of the genetics of the plant. And that's why you can buy seeds from all over the world 
And as long as the conditions are right within your garden, you can expect to get a fruit that will taste exactly like the one that produced the seed. Or a root, like a beet that might come from Italy, it's going to be pretty much the same when you grow it in your garden. <clears throat> you can try to mimic the soil and the weather as much as possible, but it really comes down to the genetics of the plants that determine how they taste and how they perform. Okay, Shannon Davis has a question. I'm in Arizona. Most of my plants are in the ground. Mail ordered granulated lime arrived yesterday. Do I need it? Is it too late to add lime? This gets back to soil. Okay, so lime is added to acidic soil. <clears throat> you may have heard it called sweetening the soil because people think that acidic soil is sour. So you add lime to sweeten it. Only add lime if you know that your soil is acidic. If you don't know that, get a soil test done first. If you have an alkaline soil and you add lime, you could be creating a pH imbalance to the point that the plants might even grow because your pH is too high. So it's not necessarily too late to be adding lime. The better part of that question is, should you be adding lime at all? Get a soil test done to determine that, okay? Um, Lee Nagao asked, could it be a soil difference to give a different taste? Um, yes. Slightly. Now, minerals do affect the taste that we determine from plants. So if there's a particular mineral that a plant really likes to use, and that's what we're used to tasting, it can make a difference. But for the most part, you're probably not going to notice it. I've eaten uh, peaches from Colorado and peaches from, Col or from California, Soils are completely different. Climates are different. I honestly can't determine much difference between a Colorado peach and a California peach because the type of peaches that they're growing are just great tasting peaches. Uh, consider running an experiment of your own where you create a soil in a bed different from soil in another bed, grow plants, the same plant in both, and see if you can determine the difference in taste. And my guess is you really can't. Okay, <clears throat> Money Pit Homestead out last week asked, is it true you pick st strawberries quickly off the plant so they do better the following years? Another great question. I like growing strawberries. In fact, my strawberries just started popping up over the winter last week. So here's the key to growing strawberries. Strawberries generally have a three-year life cycle. So in the first year, they'll start as a very young plant. They'll put on leaves. They'll probably start growing some fruit. And then the winter will hit and they'll go dormant. The second year, they'll pop up and become very robust, a much bigger plant with a lot of fruit produced. And then in the winter, they, they go dormant. And then in the third year, they'll produce fruit, but not as much as that second year. And in the fourth and fifth year and beyond, the strawberries may not be very productive at all. <clears throat> so when I plant my strawberries, I work in a three-year cycle. And every three years, I'm taking out some of my old plants and putting in some of the um, little sister plants that, that I'm taking from uh, some nice mature strawberries. And so in that first year, the strawberry is developing its roots and building into a strong plant. Yes, plucking off the flowers right away after you plant is something you should definitely do. That early fruit, I also encourage that you pick off that fruit so that the plant can develop and really get some good roots. Towards the end of that first season, go ahead and harvest the fruit. Don't think in terms of you have to pluck off the flower or pluck, up, pluck off the baby strawberries before they ripen. The plants already had a few months to start developing. So take advantage of that three-year cycle. And in the end of the first year, go ahead and harvest. 
pluck off the strawberries as soon as they're ripe. That'll help the plant continue to grow. But you don't have to pluck everything off in that first year. Uh, Wayne Kerr is asking, any issues gardening with hard water? And <clears throat> no, in fact, quite the opposite. The reason hard water is hard is because of the minerals in it. And often those minerals are the same minerals that plants need. Now, if your water comes from a well or an aquifer in your particular area, those minerals are probably going to be naturally occurring in your soil anyway. So it's not going to be like you're adding anything new to your plants. It's already there in the soil. And it's just another way to get some minerals into maybe some of the pots that you're using potting, potting soil in. So I've got hard water. I use a filter for when I drink it, but I don't filter it at all when I use it in my garden. Um, okay, let's go ahead and um, it's so great to see the comments back and going back and forth. And we've got almost 150 people on the chat, so welcome to everybody. Okay, um, Liquid Solidus 9000 had asked, have you ever used willow water for promoting root growth? And especially for new gardeners out there, this raises a really interesting subject. <clears throat> the short answer is no. But the reason he's asking this question is because willows are known for their properties of encouraging root growth in other plants. So if you're growing cuttings, you'll probably dip them into a root hormone that you buy and that will encourage through the, the auxins that, um, that the, the, the cuttings will need to start growing roots. Well, willows, if you take cuttings from willows and soak them in water, that water creates basically the same type of chemicals. So if you've got willows and you have other plants that you want to grow from cuttings, Try soaking them in some of that willow water and you'll probably see an increase in their root development. So Lee is asking, if I started my strawberry from seeds, do I count the first year into the three year cycle? Um, count the year you put them into the soil uh, when they actually can start growing their roots. <clears throat> Whether they came from seed or came from the daughter plants, Count that first year as the first year that they're growing in the soil in your garden. Okay, um, Ron on your left retired. How deep of a container should I use to plant an indeterminate tomato plant? And so when you're using a bucket or a pod or some type of container to grow your vegetable garden plants, Think in terms of how deep the root system can go and how big the plant is going to get. For an indeterminate tomato plant, it's possible for that plant to grow 12 feet tall. You probably, if you're growing in a container, will prune it to maybe five or six feet tall. So your container needs to be large enough with the soil in it that it can handle a plant that's growing that tall. And to grow that tall, it's going to need some type of trellis. So if you're growing in a container near a wall or near a fence, you can use that as a trellis by just stringing some wire or twine up it. But in the wind and the weather, that plant is going to be subjected to a lot of force sideways, and you don't want it falling over. So the container needs to be big enough to support the size of the plant. Also, when a plant like an indeterminate tomato is growing, it's got a pretty substantial root system. And at the end of the season, when I've pulled up my tomatoes, it's not unusual for the roots to be 18, maybe even 24 inches into the soil. That's half a meter deep and more. So. Think about that as you determine the size of your container, because if you don't give the plant's roots adequate room, then the plant's not going to grow to adequate size. So at a minimum, 
I would use a five gallon bucket and I would only let the plant grow about four feet tall, pruning it. If I wanted the plant to grow more than that, I'd use a 10 gallon container. And at the end of the season, when you pull your plant out, take a look at how much root development you had. And the next year that may, may help you determine how big the container should be for the next time. <clears throat> so James Hanold is asking, do I need to fertilize my seedlings or will they be fine until I'm able to transfer them into their space in my garden? You may have missed that um, little bit I talked about at the beginning. If your potting soil has fertilizer in it, and most store-bought potting mixes nowadays do, then no, you really sh probably shouldn't fertilize your seedlings before you put them out into the garden. If you're using a homemade mix or you know your mix does not have fertilizer in it, then you should probably use a weakened fertilizer, like half strength, before you put the plants outside. And that's just to give that little bit extra boost. I do not recommend fertilizing if the mix already has fertilizer in it. Um, <clears throat> Evan is asking, do I wait to bottom water until the outer edge is also dry or bottom water now? Uh, a lot comes down to if you even need to water it at all. Only bottom water when the soil is starting to dry out. You don't want your soil to stay wet all the time. You want it to stay moist as much as possible. Now, I will use the surface of my uh, seedling containers to determine if it's starting to get to that point. If the surface is just starting to dry out, like you say, drying out around the edges, then yes, that's usually about the time that I'll start bottom watering my seedlings. I'll often leave at least one or two of the little plugs, the little um, pot areas within a tray without a seed in it so that I can put my finger in and actually see how moist the soil is. So use some way to determine if the soil is too wet or too dry before you actively get on a schedule of bottom watering your seedlings. And if you know the potting soil has fertilizer and everything is going great and your plants are starting to turn light green, it might be because you're over watering. So do try to determine how wet the soil mix is before you automatically start bottom watering. Um, okay, um, five minute gardener. I have an old Christmas tree that I've been trying to decide what to do. Uh, would the branches be good for a Hugo culture raised bed? And I've got a couple videos <clears throat> very popular videos. One is about Hugo culture. One is how to fill a raised bed. And in both of those, I discuss using branches to uh, fill the bottom of a bed. In Hugo culture, you basically take a whole bunch of logs and, and branches, cover it with soil, and let it decay. And you're planting in that soil that is in, on top of all that decaying wood. When I fill my beds, I put the bottom half of some type of wood and branches to help uh, increase the, so the water retention within the bottom of the bed. And as they decompose, they add nutrients. And you can use just about any type of wood you want. So Christmas trees can actually be a nice source for some of that wood material. The resins in conifers will mean that the wood will break down at a slower rate than wood from a hardwood like um, aspen, for instance, in my area. Uh, so I'll often mix different types of wood if I have it available. So I'll put some aspen branches, I'll put some pine branches, and they'll decompose at different rates. But yes, definitely you can uh, use your old Christmas tree to, to use in your garden. So um, Daniela, asked, I planted garden in the fall in very large pots and have them in an unheated greenhouse. Can I put them outside without hardening off? And also in Colorado Springs too. <coughs> so it depends on if the plant is still dormant or if it started growing. Now garlic is 
very hardy. So you can probably move it from the greenhouse outside and it'll have no problems. Except on a day like today where we've had temperature 14 degrees and the high today is going to be about freezing. Uh, for plants that are already starting to grow, I would look at long-term forecasts before I determine when I put them outside and definitely consider hardening them off. A video that I've got coming out here in a few days shows my fruit trees and I'm starting my home, home orchard. Well, I got the fruit trees and they were already starting to bud and leaf. If I put them outside exposed to this 14 degree weather, I can expect that the leaves would be damaged and the tree might not even survive. <clears throat> so even though they're bare root trees, I'm using methods of hardening them off to get the leaves used to changing conditions. So if you have pots that are inside or pots in an untreated or unheated greenhouse, put them outside right away if there's no growth, if they're still dormant. But if they're growing at all, and this holds true pretty much with all transplants, yes, you should consider hardening them off, especially when you know that harsh weather is coming. Um, overworked gardener um, had asked before and also mentioned now about doodle bugs being very, very annoying. <coughs> I had a garden in Oklahoma, and I've mentioned this in, in some of my conversations and videos earlier, had a terrible year, nothing grew. The birds were getting to the plants. There were lots of other issues, but one of the problems I had was with the pill bugs or the, the doodle bugs or the roly polies. Individually, they're not a problem. In fact, I actually encourage them because one of their primary sources of food is decomposing organic material. So they can actually help decompose some of your organic mulches in the garden. So one here or there is not a big deal and you shouldn't worry about it. But in Oklahoma, what I discovered was they had formed a nest, a home, in a pocket that was filled with nothing but decomposing leaves and wood. And there were thousands of them. And when they would venture out, they would just devastate the young seedlings. So if you've got a problem with those type of insects and there is a whole bunch of them, try to seek out where their nest is, where they're repopulating by the hundreds or thousands. And it's probably an area deep in the mulch or maybe in a leaf pile. And if you can find that and you can break it apart, Hopefully, you can lessen some of the problems that you're having with that particular bug. So, Blathemus Buddha, good to see you here today. Pretty Alice Moon, welcome again. <coughs> We're uh, up to 165 people on the live stream. So, that's wonderful. It's great to see you all here today. Uh, Antonio Garcia asked last week, asked, can you mix worm castings in your seed soil? Absolutely. My worm castings right now, that's what I'm using them for. I haven't put any of it out into the garden. I haven't used any of it to make worm tea. Most of my worm castings right now were used for my potting soil mix. It doesn't need to be in the seed starter mix because the young seedlings don't need nutrients. The, the seed is, per, is giving them all the nutrients they need. But when you transplant those seedlings into a potting soil mix, worm castings are awesome to add to that mix. So that's one of the reasons I have my worms, is just so I can add the castings to my potting soil. Okay, so um, this is a really good one that I wanted to talk about. I gave it a three star. So when I when I choose the questions I'm gonna answer from the previous week, I'll give them one star, two star, three star, and I'll, I'll usually answer in that order. And so Kristen Ann asked if I could share some ways to stay motivated when the work gets really hard in the garden. And 
I, I feel the pain. This week, I worked really hard in my garden. <clears throat> I got all of the beds filled with soil finally. I got my asparagus in, as you saw, if you watched the video from last night. I've got more seeds in. I've moved a lot of the material around that was just causing you know, a mess in the garden. And that was in very hot days. It was hard. <clears throat> but stop and think about why you're doing it. Because ultimately, that's your goal, isn't it? And so if you're gardening because you enjoy gardening, then take a break every now and then. This is what I do. And when it's hard and you're, you're getting sore and you're getting sweaty and you need to take a break, well, take a break. But take the break in the garden and look around. You know, I'll, I'll be tired and I'll come in and I'll grab myself a glass of iced tea or lemonade, but then I go back out in the garden and look around and just start observing. And when I see the birds and I see the insects and maybe I see some plants starting to pop up that I didn't see before, that brings it back to why I'm doing it all in the first place. And so I might be sore and I might not even want to continue for the rest of the day, but by bringing it back to the basic reason, it gives me some of that motivation. It really helps me understand why I'm doing it in the first place. <clears throat> and then I can stop, go inside, and I use that as an opportunity now. I'm overwhelmed from the work, but I can come inside and learn about some more of what I was doing. And so I'll try to partition out certain hours of the day, and for me, it's a lot of the day. How much time today am I going to spend gardening? And it doesn't need to be all outside in the garden. It can be sitting on the couch with your phone watching one of my videos or reading someone else's blog. It could be um, reading a book. It could be starting seeds. <clears throat> Just try to cut out some of your time devoted to gardening so that you can keep your focus. And if you're brand new to gardening, and in these tough times, the reason you're watching this live stream and the reason that you've discovered me through my videos is because you just want to grow plants to grow food. <clears throat> well, then use that as your motivation too. When it's hard, and it will be hard, when it's hard, take a break. And maybe come into the house and look at your kids because if you're gardening to give your family food and you finally, for the first time, get that realization that gardening for food purposes is hard, well, give your kids a hug. Give your spouse a kiss and realize that that's why you're doing it. You're gardening not just for yourself, but for others. So when it gets hard, and it will, just get to that inner place that you have and figure out what that reason is and what your ultimate motivation is. And if you can't discover that point, if you don't know what your motivation is, well, then I suggest try something new. So let's say that you're growing lettuce and you just don't like it and it's hard and you're inundated with insects and you're ready to quit because you just don't enjoy gardening, well, then grow something else. Put some radishes in the ground. Buy a tomato plant and transplant the tomato. <clears throat> Keep trying something different because ultimately you'll discover a reason to garden. I've got some great gardener friends that have no vegetable gardens. All they grow is flowers and perennials. Well, that's great because they've discovered that that's why they garden. They like the beauty. So for them, all that effort and all of that work is so they can go outside, cut some flowers, bring them in, put them in a vase, and every day have a fresh supply of flowers as they eat their family meals. So there's a long answer to a short question, but 
Find your own personal motivation for why you're gardening and just accept that it's going to be hard and work through it. <clears throat> okay, let's get back to some of the other things that are going on. Colleen Curtis, welcome from Colorado Springs. I hope you're enjoying the cold and the snow that we're having today. Um, Adam is joining us from Canada, also in 5B. Uh, Bear River Mama, welcome. Everyday Treasures is asking a question. How do I add nitrogen to my soil without using a product from a land animal? <coughs> it's easy. Use plants. Green plants have a lot of nitrogen in them. I don't know if you heard what I began this live chat with. Nitrogen is needed by plants to turn green and grow leaves. Well, the opposite holds true as well. If you have a green plant that you pull out of the ground, including weeds, that plant has a relatively high level of nitrogen in it. You can do a couple things. <clears throat> you can use those green plants along with kitchen scraps, because most of our kitchen scraps are also high in nitrogen. You can just dig a trench in your vegetable bed, bury all of those kitchen scraps and green material, cover it up, and that will add nitrogen to your soil as it decomposes. What most gardeners do, and this is what I also recommend, is you start a compost pile. <clears throat> and in your compost pile, you'll use that green material along with the carbon materials, the browns. Compost that's made from plants has a good amount of nitrogen in it. <clears throat> so you don't have to use manures as your nitrogen source. Use plants as a nitrogen source. I use comfrey, which is a great plant. I'll have a video on that later in the year. Comfrey is high in nitrogen. And so I'll use my comfrey leaves as a mulch. I'll also steep the leaves in water to make a tea that has a good amount of nitrogen in it. Uh, kelp has nitrogen in it. There are a lot of fertilizers out there that you can buy that are plant-based. <clears throat> so just look into that a little bit. It doesn't need to be an animal-based product um, to get the nutrients into your garden. <clears throat> and so Daniel Brown asked, has anyone heard of lasagna gardening and know if it works good or better than other methods? I have a video coming out on lasagna gardening in a couple months, and I'll show you how to do it. For those of you that don't know what lasagna gardening is, it's a process of developing the, uh, the space where your seeds and plants are going to grow. It's often done in open ground. And the reason it's called lasagna gardening is because like making lasagna, you're putting in different layers of material. So in lasagna, you'll put a layer of sauce and then a layer of, of the noodles and then another layer of sauce and a layer of, of meat or mushrooms and then another, or, along with some cheese and then another layer of noodles. And lasagna is built just adding all these different layers of different flavors. So in lasagna gardening, you might start with a layer of cardboard. And then on top of that, you'll put a layer of compost and then a layer of leaves and then a layer of some uh, freshly cut grass. And then you'll put a layer of some more compost. <clears throat> and then you should put a layer of some of your native soil, a step that's often left out. And then you put another layer of compost. And so the idea is that you've just got all these layers of different materials all of which should be enriching your soil. If you don't add some of your native soil, if you're just adding compost and grass and cardboard, you can grow plants in it, but it might be deficient in some of the minerals, which is why I like to advocate using native soil, which should have a lot of minerals in it, along with leaves. So if you get a good blend of all of those different materials, you can grow your plants in it. And so ultimately your lasagna bed should be maybe 18 inches high, half a meter high, 
All of that being material intended to add nutrients for your plants. It can be very effective. The problem comes in as to the timing of when you put the plants in because as the material, all this organic matter decomposes, it is going to take nitrogen to decompose. And that can cause a deficiency within your plants. Because if you've got a plant growing in a very fresh, compost-rich environment like that, the bacteria are going to absorb the nitrogen faster than the plant can. And so the plant might become deficient in nitrogen. So it's usually better to start a lasagna garden bed as far as possible in advance ahead of when you're going to put the plants in. But it can be very effective. Realize that all that organic material is going to break down. And so the height of your pile is going to flatten. So you may start the season with a lasagna bed that is 18 inches high. And at the end of the season, it might only be six to 10 inches high. You have to think about that as well when you're growing your plants. And so expect to add more compost and mulch to the lasagna garden as the plants grow. <clears throat> okay, so parameterized is asking a question, is dirty rainwater from the roof okay for outdoor and indoor plants or do I need to filter it? Uh, that's a really good question. <clears throat> Some of it depends on the type of roof you have. And so if you have a roof that is some type of composite material, there might be some chemicals that are leaching as the rainwater rolls through that, that material. Uh, a lot of my, the roofs in my area are asphalt shingles. And so particularly older roofs where the, the sandy material is is gone, it's blown away, and so now the rainwater is running through the asphalt, it's also gaining some of those chemicals. And then you've got all the birds, the animals that might be living on the, or at least frequenting, frequenting your roof, and all of that waste material is getting into the water. So I do not suggest or recommend using fresh roof water for your indoor plants without filtering um, because of some of those things like um, the bird waste that you might be bringing into your house. <clears throat> there can be harmful bacteria and pathogens in that water. Indoor plants, probably not a good idea. Using it outdoors definitely is something you should consider. And so take into consideration what the material of your roof is so if you've got a cedar roof, uh, it will do some of the filtering naturally. And as the rainwater comes across that wood, you can use that water pretty much right away. In most cases, because of the bird waste and all those other materials and chemicals that could be there, I would suggest that you use unfiltered roof water in perennial beds or around trees, areas uh, that don't include edible plants. As for your um, vegetable garden, uh, yeah, I would definitely consider filtering it before using it on my plants. But it's, it's a definite way to reuse what Mother Nature is giving us in the form of rain. So um, I hope that helps. <coughs> Until recently here in Colorado, it was, it was actually illegal for us to harvest and use roof water. That changed a few years ago and now we're able to collect some of that rainwater. I haven't done it yet, it's in my plans, but when I use the water from my roofs, I'm just gonna be using it in my flower beds and around my trees. Um, Raman is saying, I have baked clay roof, I collect rainwater, how come after a few days the water is rather slimy? Um, it could be some of those clay particles that have floated to the surface. <clears throat> it could be some of that bird waste. It could be some type of mold or fungus that's growing on the top. There are lots of things that are occurring in nature and um, can create film on the water. So um, 
I would suggest in that particular case, um, maybe filtering the water that's coming off of a, of a clay roof. Um, it shouldn't be harmful, um, whatever that material is on the top, but it could be. And that's why I don't recommend using that type of stuff in a vegetable garden bed. Okay, um, Adam Petherick asked last week, is it true you can save seeds from F1 hybrids? Uh, and so F1 is um, the, the, the term that seed companies will use to identify a hybrid. It's Finio 1. It's the first year of the hybrid. And so the concept between a hybrid plant like this, uh, for example, you, you have a, a yellow tomato that's a, um, a parent, and you have a red tomato that's a parent, and the seed company determined that if they cross-pollinate those tomatoes, they'll get an orange tomato that's really sweet. And so that's what they do, and they'll sell you that hybrid. Well, that hybrid seed in that first year is an F1. Now, occasionally a seed company will do this, and I did this when I was trying to start determining if my Galileo Moon tomato could remain um, sustainable from generation to generation. If you take that F1 seed, Say, or take that F1 fruit, save the seed, and then grow it the next year. In that next year, that seed is now an F2 seed because it's the second year. You have very little likelihood that an F2 seed will match the fruit of the F1 seed. But go ahead and do it. And I did this a number of years ago at, at Galileo Garden. In our very first year, we couldn't afford to buy seeds. And in the, 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 er, the previous season when I wasn't there, they had grown a lot of sun gold tomato, which is kind of a, a small orange, delicious cherry type of tomato. Well, the following year, there were plants popping up everywhere from the, the tomatoes that had fallen onto the ground. And so I let those plants grow and I actually transplanted them into beds and started growing effectively an F2 plant because the sun gold is an F1 hybrid. Well, in that second year, I got red tomatoes, I got orange tomatoes, I got big tomatoes, I got little tomatoes. Most of the tomatoes taste terrible. That's what you get in an F2 hybrid. So yes, you can save the seeds from an F1, but I only suggest doing it if you want to experiment and see what happens. Don't expect that an F2 is going to match an F1 hybrid result. <clears throat> so Randy DeShane is joining us from Central California, Modesto. My father was born in Modesto. My parents were married in Modesto. Uh, my grandparents lived in Modesto. I lived in Merced a number of years. Um, so I've, I've got a great affinity to the Central Valley. So welcome, Randy. Good to see you here. Um, Johnny Castile is asking, <clears throat> if my wife and I are growing mini cantaloupes and zucchinis vertically on a trellis, how densely can they be planted in a raised bed? Great question. You do need to think about the root system. And so a mini melon, probably doesn't have as, as extensive a root system as a full-grown melon, but I'll, I'll use tomatoes as an example. So um, tomatoes typically are recommended by the seed companies to be grown 24 inches apart or more, <clears throat> and that's to allow room for the plant to grow laterally. I've even seen some recommendations that the potato or that the tomatoes should be three feet apart for that reason. When I grow my tomatoes on my trellises, I'll put my tomatoes between 12 and 18 inches apart because the plants will be growing vertically, straight up. I only need to allow enough room in the soil for those roots to grow, not for the plant to grow. 
And so that holds true with, with melons and cucumbers as well. When I grow cucumbers vertically, I'll have the plants as close together as six inches. Um, it varies based on the seeds <clears throat> when I thin out the plants, but you'll see most packages probably recommend cucumbers be at least 18 inches apart. All of my cucumbers will be between six and 12 inches apart when I'm growing them on trellises. Uh, because if I've got a good, rich soil that they're growing in, the roots will have ample room to grow. So definitely put them closer than what's probably recommended on the seed packet as far as how far apart the rows should be. <clears throat> and so if a seed package says to uh, thin out the plants 12 inches apart, then if you're growing vertically, you should be able to get away with six to eight inches apart with very few issues. Okay, let's get back to a question from um, last week. Uh, and there were a lot of them, so I appreciate all of it. Um, Rob, since you joined us this week, I'll go ahead and cover your question. Uh, you said, most of my seedlings are looking good. Garden beds are tilled and amended, rocks, sticks, and weeds removed, which is great. That's all wonderful, good spring activity. <clears throat> the only problem is I have no idea where all of my vegetable seedlings should go. I can find out how far apart to transplant them, but I don't know which plants to put where. And this is a very common issue, especially for new gardeners. And if you're new to gardening, my guess is you've probably got this concern. You've got all these seeds, you're ready to start growing, and you just don't know how to start. Well, just start with one plant and go out to your garden in whatever bed you're using <coughs> and figure out what that plant needs to grow successfully. And when it reaches maturity, how big is that plant going to be? And so let's start with lettuce. So most lettuce is only going to grow maybe six inches high. It's a very low plant, but it might grow eight to 10 inches wide. So it takes up a fair amount of space. So as you look at your bed, you'll put your lettuce on the side of your bed that's closest to the sun. So if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, you put the lettuce on the south side of your bed. If you're in the Southern Hemisphere, you'll put your lettuce on the north side of your bed. And the reason you do this is because you're looking ahead to the other plants that are in your bed. Lettuce is so short, it's not going to cast any shade on any other plant. So you put it on the edge of the, of the bed closest to the sun because it's not gonna cast any shade. Start with that and then look at the other plants and the other seeds that you're going to be growing and do the opposite. Look at the plants that are going to grow the biggest and the tallest. So let's say you're growing zucchini. Well, zucchini can get as high as a meter tall. Well, it's going to shade out a lot of plants. So you can put zucchini and lettuce in the same bed, but put the lettuce or put the zucchini on the side that's opposite the sun so that as it grows and fills up a lot of space, it's not casting much shade over anything but whatever's on the outside of your bed. And then in between the zucchini and the lettuce, start looking at the other plants you're growing and try to place them based on size from tallest to shortest with the sun in mind. That's one way to figure out how to start putting your plants in the garden. Another great way is figuring out what plants you're going to be harvesting most often. So if you've got a lot of plants or a lot of beds, you know, a fairly big garden space, maybe you've started bigger than you maybe should have. Well, think about the plants that you're going to be harvesting every day and put those plants in a bed that's closest to your kitchen so that when you go outside, 
you just go to that bed, harvest quickly, and go back in. A plant like garlic, which is only harvested once a year, well, that's the kind of plant that you can put in the farthest out bed because you're not going to be harvesting it except once a year. Put the lettuce, put the tomatoes, put the radishes in beds that are closest to your kitchen. You should also consider the water requirements of your plants. So when you decide what plants to put in which beds, learn a little bit about what their water needs are. And so plants like melons and squashes, where the fruit is filled with water, well, the reason that they have a lot of water in the fruit is because the plants require a lot of water. Put a zucchini in the same bed as a, uh, a yellow squash, which is also in the same bed as a melon, which is in the same bed as a cucumber. All of those plants are going to require a lot of water, more water than probably a tomato plant needs. So you can group your plants that way. <coughs> You may have figured out through this explanation, you don't have to have one bed that's dedicated to all tomatoes or one bed that's dedicated to all lettuce. Think about how much food you're going to eat or how much you're growing for your family and that's how many plants you should be growing. And if it's not going to fill up a full bed, then based on some of the things that I just said, you can figure out what you need to put in the bed to fill out the space. Okay, another question from last week. <clears throat> Hugo Poop 5678. I noticed you put straw or hay as mulch over your seeds and planted the other day. Won't that stop the plants from growing as the mulch is meant to suppress weeds? Another great question. One of the benefits of mulch, yes, is to suppress weeds. But that's if you use a thick layer of mulch that is cutting down the germination of the weed seeds and smothering the weeds. Straw and grass is very light. And so in my area, except on days like today where it looks like I've already got about five inches of snow out there, most of the time my climate is very dry. So when I start seeds in spring and summer, the soil is drying out very quickly. I either have to water three or four times a day to keep the soil level surface moist, or I can put a very light layer of mulch, like a straw or like a dried grass. Think about the seed. It has enough energy to push that young seedling through soil. And soil is denser than a light layer of straw. So I put that little bit of mulch, not a lot. You can still see the soil through the mulch. It's just a very light layer so that instead of watering four times a day to keep the soil moist, maybe I only have to go out in the morning and late afternoon to water and keep it moist because that little bit of mulch gives its other benefit, which is to help moderate the soil moisture level by minimizing some of the evaporation. So I do encourage that you have a very light mulch and dry areas that'll help keep the soil from drying out. In my mind, it's better for that seedling to have to fight its way through a little bit of mulch than it is for that seedling to die because the upper half inch of the soil was baked in the sun. So a light mulch is okay, but I don't use the full level of mulch that I would normally have in a bed. After the seedlings have established and are growing, then I'll add more straw mulch to get the benefit of the weed suppression. Okay. Uh, so LJ, LJ, what do you do about grubs in the ground? As I'm about to put some plants in the ground and I did not plan on doing it or doing it the garden until two weeks ago, so I did not put any grub killer down. I actually don't use grub killer. And one of the ways I get rid of my grubs <coughs> is 
in the spring and summer when I put plants in, if I'm digging through the soil and come across a grub, I'll go ahead and put it in a bag. And this year, my plan is to give that bag to my daughter to feed to her chickens. If you've got chickens, you can actually let your chickens loose in the garden before you plant. They'll find a lot of those grubs before you even get to the planting point, and they'll actually help you uh, loosen up your soil a little bit. But if you don't have chickens, I'll take care of it at the time of planting. Now, most of the grubs that you're going to find in your garden are going to grow into beetles, and many of those beetles are actually beneficial in the garden. There are some predatory beetles out there that will take care of some of our pests. There are beetles that are going to help decompose some of that organic material that we're using as mulch. So I'm the type of gardener that doesn't kill grubs using chemicals. I allow them to go ahead and continue to, to live because they'll benefit my garden overall. As they emerge, they'll also be a food source for some of the birds that I want in my garden because the birds will eat the grubs. Oh, and along the way, they might eat a caterpillar that's starting to eat some of my plants. <clears throat> so I let the, the grubs go. If you want to stop your grubs completely because you just don't like the grubs, go ahead and take one of those grubs and try to do an analysis, do an online search of grubs or beetle larva and see if you can identify just exactly what kind of insect that grub is going to grow into. You might, fi might find out it's beneficial and not harmful at all to your plants. Or you might find out that yes, it is one of those kind of grubs that will eat the roots of your plant. In that case, there are some great organic methods to fight grubs. Um, Bacillus thuringiensis, BT, you can actually buy in a couple different varieties. And there are types of bacteria that you can work into your soil and they will kill the grubs in the soil, even now after a period of time where maybe you would have wanted to spray. So um, try to find out what kind of grub it is before you automatically assume that it's bad. And if you can determine what kind of grub it is, it might be able to give you a very precise method for dealing with it. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, oh good, Rob said, gave me a thumbs up that, that he got germination. That's wonderful. Um, Tim Urbany is asking, I finished one of three planned cattle panel greenhouses a week ago with six mil plastic and a 40% shade cloth. It's 50 in there right now with three inches of snow and 20 degrees outside. That's awesome. I'm, a, I'm using six mil plastic over my cattle panel hoops that I've got. When I finish here, I'm planning on going outside with my soil thermometer to see what kind of difference I have. Um, it's below freezing outside, but I fully expect that my soil temperature is still well above freezing. Um, that's the whole point for putting the plastic over it. So <clears throat> that's wonderful that you have that even with a 40% shade cloth. Uh, if you haven't used hoops and plastic, I strongly encourage it either this year or in the future. I've got some videos to talk about that. I'll have more videos that talk about it. And one of the nice things when you discover that you can put a hoop over your raised bed and cover it with plastic and have great results is it gives you the motivation and the knowledge to then take it to that next step, which is to build a greenhouse using <coughs> essentially the same methods. You just have bigger hoops with uh, a lot larger piece of plastic and you can get some of the great results. Okay, so um, over 200 people that have joined the live chat. It's great to see you all now. Uh, I encourage if you've missed anything, this will be recorded and then uh, available as a replay. I think it takes about an hour for that to happen. So if you missed any of the, the comments and discussion up to this point, go ahead and feel free to watch the replay at some point in the future um, to see what you missed. 
Um, oh, Rob, before I get to this, this point that I want to raise is asking, um, do you trellis broccoli? <coughs> no. Um, broccoli is one of those plants that has a very defined height, and it's rarely higher than two feet. Uh, a lot of broccoli is going to be much smaller than that. Think about how thick that stock is. So when you buy broccoli, that that stock at the bottom of the head, that's the top of the plant. The stock at the bottom of the plant is going to be thicker and stronger. <clears throat> so broccoli grows very well with absolutely no need for trellising. When I grow broccoli, I will grow plants side by side a little bit closer than is often recommended so that as they grow, they support themselves. But that's only because I've got very strong winds that can come through as a result of thunderstorms. And I don't want any of my plants to be growing over include, or blowing over, including broccoli. So grow broccoli side by side with other broccoli and essentially they'll support and trellis themselves. Okay, um, <clears throat> so let's get to um, the point of the discussion where I start sharing some of my philosophy and what it means to be a gardener and how you can become a better gardener. And so last week I talked about that, just how gardeners are special people. And if you're just starting off, you might not consider yourself a gardener yet. Uh, you say you're a newbie or you're a newcomer or this is your first bed or your first year. Well, just by starting, I want to tell you right off the bat, you are a gardener. So I hope that none of you are thinking that because you're brand new to this, that for some reason you're less of a gardener than someone like me that's been doing this for a decade. We're all in this together. But the way to get from where you are now, even if you are a more experienced gardener, is to learn. Learn more about gardening. Every day I learn something new about gardening. Every single day. So I suggest that as I mentioned much earlier in, in this live stream, spend a certain amount of time every day devoted to gardening. And in the winter when nothing's growing, it could be 15 minutes a day that you just get online and look up some new gardening quote and use that as motivation for the day. Or maybe spend an hour or two, even in the winter, watching videos. And I've got 150 videos at, at this point of all kinds of different gardening topics. And when I look at some of the other gardening channels out there, they've got a thousand videos in their library. There are many great sources online. So give yourself a certain period of the day, every day where you just watch a gardening video. Even the bad videos you can learn something from. <clears throat> One of the reasons that I started this channel was because I was doing exactly that. I was at the Galileo Garden. I knew a lot about gardening, but I knew that there was a lot more that I needed to learn. So every day I was watching gardening videos to learn more. I was reading blogs. I was getting books by the hundreds to read. And I realized that there's a lot of videos out there on gardening that aren't accurate. And they're giving bad advice. And they might be made very poorly, so bad that you can't even watch them. Well, that motivated me to start producing some videos with accurate information that was in a format that might be a little easier to follow. I had reached the point in my gardening knowledge where I could recognize the good information from the bad information. And that's why I encourage you to learn because the more you learn, especially from a trusted source, especially from a university with research-based information, the more you learn from good sources, the more you'll be able to learn from the bad sources. <clears throat> Some of the most memorable things you're going to have in your garden 
are the times when things go wrong and you learn from a mistake. Well, that same mental process is at play when you watch somebody tell you how to garden and you know it's wrong because you've learned how to do it right. And so now that lesson is ingrained in your head. So don't think that you only have to find one trustworthy source. Keep going out there. Keep looking for information at every available opportunity and add it to your own personal mental library. And then try something new. I had some questions like this come up this last week <coughs> where people were wondering how they could learn more about gardening. Well, it's by trying new things. As I've said before, start by growing lettuce and then start growing radishes and then start growing tomatoes and then start going, growing something like a birdhouse gourd or a loofah gourd, something that's totally outside your comfort zone. Now, I'm talking a long period of time. You don't have to do all of this this season. But this season, stretch yourself a little bit. Put yourself out there. If you're growing for the sole purpose of food for your family, well, put in some flowers because flowers are great for the insects and attracting a lot of nature to your garden. Expand what you're doing. And I'm going to go down here real quickly. Um, I don't know if you can see Lily. I had some questions asking about Lily this week. Uh, Lily wants to join me. She doesn't normally join me here when I'm on the live chat, but sorry that I broke my chain of thought just to show Lily, because I know there's a lot of you that like to see Lily. Um, but the idea being that stretch yourself, grow, keep learning more, and you will become a better gardener. Expand this one further level, because I said this in one of my earlier videos on the best way to learn gardening, and that is to teach gardening. Teach gardening to somebody. If you have a child in your house, that's the best way to teach gardening. If you have a dog in your garden, and believe me, we gardeners are crazy, and I have done this. With Lily in the garden, when I'm putting some plant in the ground or just any type of gardening activity, I've talked to Lily and told her what it was I was doing. Because if I can verbalize to myself in a way that I can understand for myself, well, then it's ingrained in my brain that much better. If you do that, sure, start by talking to yourself, but also talk to others. Tell your neighbor about some great thing that you discovered in the garden. Or if you found grubs, go ahead and scoop up a bunch of those grubs, put them in a bag, and go to somebody else and say, hey, I had these grubs in my garden. And by verbalizing it and talking about it, that other person might know more about grubs and give you an answer as well. So keep learning about gardening. Those of us that have been gardening for a long time know that we will never know everything there is to know about gardening. Every day there's something new. The video that I released last night when I put my asparagus in the ground, as I was researching asparagus so that I could do a video, I learned things. I've been growing asparagus for decades, but even in that process, I'm getting ready to teach you about asparagus. I learned a lot. Now, the method that I showed you was a method that I've used. And one of the things that I learned was that method that I knew was different than a lot of other recommended methods was substantiated by the University of Wisconsin. I had never seen the specific data from the University of Wisconsin before talking about how you should plant asparagus. But as I was looking for sources to confirm that, yes, indeed, I was doing it right, I came across university studies that showed, yes, indeed, I was doing it right. <clears throat> so you don't have to worry whether you're new or experienced when it comes to gardening. 
Just keep learning. Just keep pushing the limits and just keep becoming a better gardener. And we will all benefit from it. So let's get back to the comments. Stephanie, I'm, I'm glad you appreciated showing Lily. Um, she's getting older. She does a lot of her time just lying around. Uh, yesterday, she joined me briefly for a video that I was making, but um, I couldn't keep her outside. So she came in and spent most of her time napping. Um, Raymond asks, Scott, do you grow aloe vera? What's the best way to grow them faster and bigger? Yes, I do grow aloe vera. In fact, <clears throat> I have a plant that was given to me about 12 years ago by a couple that grew huge amounts of aloe vera that gave me a pretty good size plant. And then I proceeded to spend about 10 years doing everything I could to kill that plant. And so what I've discovered now that the plant is recovering and after I learned about aloe vera, perfect segue, because I never really took much time to learn about aloe vera. I had just been told how easy it was to grow and I was doing everything wrong. Aloe vera likes a lot of sun. And that was one of the biggest problems I had is I had it in an area in my often or in my office where it didn't get much sun. And so it started a slow, gradual decline over the years. It also doesn't like a lot of water. It's a succulent, and so it will store its water in the leaves. So it needs to be very well-draining soil, and that soil should be allowed to get relatively dry before you water it again. So the two worst things you can do is too much water and too little sun. So grow it in, a, in a, a soil that drains well. Don't water it a lot. It, it also doesn't really need much in the way of fertilizer. Give it some sun and it should do fine. <coughs> Champ Rolo, how do I protect my garden from deer? I've got a video in my library on how to deer proof your garden. And I show some of the methods that I use to keep deer away in my previous house. Those methods are still true today. Uh, the plants, you can't deer proof a plant. Deer will eat anything if they're hungry enough. But there are ways to build structures and to build to plan your garden to keep deer out. So look up that video in my library and hopefully um, it, it gives you some great ideas. Um, uh, and Bear River Mama, I have about 20 in our yard every day. Yeah, in that video, I actually show some footage of the deer walking through my yard. When we moved in, they, there were no fences. And we had about 20 that lived in a little stand of scrub oak in the backyard. Over the years, by adding fences and, batting, and adding other barriers, I was able to have a garden. But it's hard. It really comes down to barriers. You've got to keep your plants away from the deer. Um, and yeah, definitely, as Bear River Mama says, they'll come right up to the front door and eat the potted plants. And I've got some footage of that happening as well. So keep the comments coming. We're getting um, close to the end. We've still got about another 10 minutes to go. But if you have any questions you want to throw out here at the end, <coughs> definitely throw them my way. Um, let's go to a quick question from last week. Patricia Cavallo or Carvalho asked, what about zucchini? Can I plant two to three seeds in a five gallon pot? And so this gets back to that idea of vertical gardening. If you're going to allow your plants to grow up a trellis, as long as you give them enough room for the roots to grow, you can put the plants closer together. But in a five gallon container, you're probably not supplying enough room for three plants. You might be able to get away with two plants that are going to be growing up a trellis. So a crookneck squash, for instance, you could grow two of those in a five gallon bucket. But a zucchini plant gets quite large and that requires a lot of roots to support. 
So right off the bat, there's not going to be enough room for two, even um, three. No way could you get to grow in a five gallon bucket. One zucchini in a bucket that size is going to be enough. It should be big enough to support the needs of that individual plant, but don't put more than one seed and grow one more than, don't grow more than one zucchini in a five gallon bucket. In just over a week, I think in a week and a half, one of my videos coming out will talk about square foot gardening. And so I'll be discussing this concept of intensive gardening in this video that will be coming out in a couple of weeks. Uh, square foot gardening is practiced by a lot of gardeners. It's a very common method. And in the book that I'll actually be discussing, it gives some very precise suggestions as to how far apart you should put your seeds and grow your plants. And so if you're familiar with square foot gardening, or if you do a quick search of square foot gardening online and find out some of those recommendations, anywhere that in square foot gardening, it's recommended that you only put one plant per square foot, then in a five gallon bucket, you should only be growing one of those plants. Um, so Barbara Grace Wan, what plants to plant to deter free range chickens from the garden? <clears throat> uh, chickens are a lot like deer, as you obviously already know, and they're going to eat a lot of different plants. And I don't have chickens in my garden yet. I'm still a few years away from that. But there are a number of plants that, are, that if they have a very strong fragrance and their, their stems and their leaves have bristles on them. Those kind of plants tend to deter chicken. So the, the one that comes to my mind is lavender. Lavender has, is very fragrant, including the leaves have a very strong fragrance. The leaves have a lot of bristles and are rough, and I'm not aware that chickens eat lavender at all. So it's those type of plants. Most of them are not going to be edible plants. So think about the kind of plants that you would have in a perennial garden. A lot of um, flowers, a lot of things um, like in, in um, the, the hot, dry areas, yucca, for instance, is a plant that is just so dense that the, the leaves are nothing that a chicken is going to be able to eat. <clears throat> On the other side of that, think about those tender vegetables that you want to eat, and those are the kinds that the chickens are going to completely devastate. So... Um, do a little research online just because I don't have a lot of chickens um, and my daughter's chickens are kept within the coop. But think about those kind of plants that you might plant to deter deer and they'll probably be effective at um, deterring the, the chickens as well. Um, had a question that just popped up from Colleen and this was also a question that I had from last week asking about cover crops. And specifically cover crops in a raised bed. I do grow cover crops in my raised bed. One that I have in the bed that the strawberries are starting to sprout in right now is vetch, hairy vetch. It's one of my favorite cover crops. I'll grow it over the winter. I actually sow the seeds in the fall and then I'll let it start to grow along with all of the other plants. It's a wonderful cover crop. I allow it to flower because it's one of the first plants that's flowering in my garden and it helps attract the bees. And then I'll save the seeds for other years. Now, I know in some areas, vetch is considered a noxious weed and that's because it's allowed to flower and those seeds sprout up just about anywhere. So I do use cover crops in beds where I don't want more of that cover crop to grow. Uh, I'll go ahead and cut off the flowers before they can set seed. But there are a lot of um, lagoons. Austrian peas, for instance, are a wonderful plant that you can grow in your vegetable beds to benefit other plants. Grow them as cover crops. There are types of oats and wheat that you can grow. Most of the cover crops that I do in my raised beds 
I will sow the seeds in the fall after I've done the last harvest for the year, let those cover crops start growing. And then in the spring, one of the things that makes cover crops good is they typically are high in nitrogen. And so it, it kind of pertains to that question from earlier. Using a cover crop that you're going to turn into your soil with the intent that that high nitrogen cover crop is going to decompose and benefit your soil can be great for raised beds. So I have a, a video that talks about cover crops. I'll probably have one more at the end of this year as I get uh, my beds prepared for next year, but there's something to consider. Uh, it, they're also called green manure because that green nitrogen source is similar to an animal-based manure source. So definitely something to consider. Thanks for asking that question. So we're getting close to the end. Um, again, I'll review the questions that were asked this week. I noticed that there weren't as many questions popping up this week, probably because I was covering a lot of different, different information. If you're watching this in replay, please add questions below. And if you have some real last minute questions here, go ahead and type them in. Hopefully they'll pop up on the stream before I conclude for today. But continue to watch the videos. I've added the third video for the week. So hopefully I can keep up this flow of three videos and a live stream because I really want to try to get as much information out to you as possible. And hopefully I'm just one of those many sources that you're using to get your gardening information and expand your gardening knowledge. So learn something this week in your garden and let's talk about it next week. Because by learning, as I've said, you will become a better gardener. Thank you everybody for the opportunity to be with you today. I'm Gardener Scott. Enjoy gardening.